I was five years old and I heard uh, Dancing in the Dark on, um, on the Muppets. There was a version of it that Kermit the Frog sang and um, I, I heard it and I immediately said to my mom, like, oh, what song is this? And she said, the song's by Bruce Springsteen. So I came home from kindergarten um, and I had, my mom gave me this album, Born to Run, the album to end all albums. I didn't have a CD player or a disc man at this time, so after school, I, um, the only CD player I knew was in my mom's car, so I sat in her car all day after school just listening to the album over and over again. Um, I didn't know you could skip tracks, I didn't know any of that, so I just listened from beginning to end, um, over and over again. The legend is, when he heard the album played for the first time, he went out in the alley behind um, the recording studio and he smashed the only copy of the record, because he was so upset with it. And he said, I hate the way it sounds, these are songs meant to be played live. This was my gateway into Bruce and um, recorded many people, you know, his greatest album ever. Darkness on the Edge of Town is the album that came three years after Born to Run. Bruce gets in this huge lawsuit with his um, manager, Mike Appel. And he had a kind of contract that's very popular in the 70s, where the manager um, has like a bigger stake in the artist's music than the performer, which is why now you have all these 70s artists who like don't have any control over the back catalog. Bruce recognized that this would happen and got in this huge lawsuit where he was fighting for his music. And during this time, Bruce was not allowed in the studio. Start getting the reputation as Bruce of Bruce as like the working man on the road every night, traveling, giving it his all to either do shows or just like sink into obscurity. So while he's on the road, he's writing songs constantly. So when he finally gets to record, he's got hundreds of songs he wants to record. Um, so I think that he recorded 70 for this album and cut it down to the 10 that make up Darkness on the Edge of Town. One of the many stereotypes about Bruce is that he's. Um, he writes these kind of like fist in the air, like angry, stick it to the man songs. That stereotype comes almost entirely from this album. Badlands, like Badlands, you get streets of fire. I'm not a boy, no, I'm a man. Like you get all these like hard hitting, um, like just hooks. And because he, he knows he can't be bigger than Born to Run, so he just tries to be more direct. This is Bruce kind of distilling his work into being like, you know, I'm not going to make Born to Run Part 2 because I don't want to, I'm beyond that. This is a beautiful album because it um, it's as far removed from Born to Run as you can be. The whole record sounds like it was performed in a garage and cut live to tape. It's sprawling, it's a double album that's not like over long and it's not a double album because of like, you know, like the ambitious like concept double album. It's a double album just because you get all kinds of songs, you get Sherry Darling, it's like a um, like a bar pop song, you get The River, which is one of the most like devastating ballads of his career. You get Ramrod, which is just like a big jamming, a blues rocker, it's a huge album. It was even more intense for me as like a young kid getting into Bruce's music, because you look at his catalog and you say, oh my god, he's got all these albums, he has collections of outtakes, um, there's albums he's never released that the fans talk about that I don't know. I love that excitement and that um, kind of like, um, like there's like a craftsmanship to it. And when um, I had kind of explored the depths of Bruce's music and I started getting into newer bands, um, that was definitely something I looked for in the artists I listened to. People like um, Robert Pollard and Guided by Voices, John Marshall and Cat Power, um, or like Bonnie Prince Billy or Ryan Adams, just like artists who like just seem to have so much material and seem to just love doing it for themselves and just kind of follow their own, um, you know, follow their arrow wherever it goes. When you look at someone like Bruce Springsteen, he never stopped because he doesn't want to. He would never stop writing because he like didn't have anything to say because it's not about that, it's about loving to write. Bruce records these demos all in one night. Um, he sits in his basement and he records these songs for the next E Street Band album. He brings the tape into the recording sessions and they make an album. They listen to the album and um, Bruce and his manager John Landau are sitting there and they say, you know what, the demos were better. The demos became Nebraska, they picked 10 of them, and this is an album entirely of Bruce and his acoustic guitar on 4-track, um, which obviously was an influence on me, just hearing like, um, vocals, guitar, and nothing else. Bruce didn't tour this album because at the time he didn't feel comfortable enough with his guitar playing to do an entire show by himself. It would be until the, the mid-90s that he would do solo acoustic shows. 
and those are probably my favorite era of Springsteen shows. The first Bruce Springsteen show I saw was after he reunited the E Street Band for The Rising. Um, but I saw him on the Devils and Dust tour, which was the same idea, but in 2005. I can't help but feel like this is one of the most perfect albums ever, and when you listen to it, um, the beautiful things you hear Bruce in his basement recording for himself. You know, we all know the story of what happened after this album. He took one of the demos that we didn't get on a song called Born in the USA and made one of the biggest, um, uh, you know, like synth rock albums of the 80s. And that would actually be the album that made Bruce Springsteen like the cultural figure he's known as. That would be the tour where he was, you know, buff, like his muscles ripping through his white t-shirt. The era I identify the most with would probably be like 87 to 92, Tunnel of Love, Lucky Town, and Human Touch, those albums. I really relate to the idea of like, um, you know, trying to write for the sake of writing and making music that's fun for you. It's just doing what he wants to, which is what he's always done, you know, and is something I love about him. You know, <laughs> Bruce Springsteen, <laughs> he's the man. <laughs>